Stacey Piercy to the Homeschool Global Summit 2020, and today I have with me Blake Bowles. He is a writer, a speaker, an adventurer, and an advocate for self-directed learning. He spent more than a decade working with unconventionally educated teens of the company that he founded, Unschool Adventures, which I want to talk about later because that's pretty exciting. He originally hails from California and has traveled all over the world. Blake is a prolific writer, and some of his best books I've read myself, including College Without High School and um, was it uh, The Art of Self-Directed Learning, I think was the other one, and Better Than College. He has recently written a new book called Why Do You Keep Sending Your Kids to School, which is why he's here today. Welcome, Blake. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you, Stacy. Great to be here. Yeah. So I think probably the first question that I, I want to uh, get into is you've written most of your books for teens. And like I've mentioned, <laughs> I've read quite a few of them. I've passed them off to my own teens. And this is the very first book that you wrote specifically for parents. So why the, why the shift in focus? Well, you've answered the question already, Stacey. I finally realized after 10 years that I can write books for teenagers or college-aged young adults, but really it's the parents and really dominantly it's moms who are finding my books, reading them first and then passing them on to their kids. And so I have finally accepted reality with this book. Why are you still sending your kids to school? Yeah, it's, it's great. I've read it cover to cover twice. I think I told you that already. <laughs> so the, the book kind of dives into what school is, what school isn't, why it works, why it doesn't work, as well as all the different alternative paths that are available. And this is a homeschool summit, so I'm gonna put you on the spot here. You did mention in the book that at first you had an opinion of homeschoolers and that has changed over time, but you do offer that as a viable alternative education option. So what kind of changed your point of view and how does it sort of fit into the theme of the book? I grew up in California public schools and I held essentially the conventional stereotypes of homeschooling. And to a certain degree, they were justified in the city where I was living. Uh, mostly it was religious people who were homeschooling. Uh, my family wasn't religious. Uh, I had never met a single one of them. And so I just had this idea that they were probably all stuck at home and sheltered. And so that's what took me up through college. And then once I started reading books about unschooling, I started to realize that homeschooling could be something that that really doesn't fit inside those stereotype boxes. And so it was learning about unschooling mostly through reading the Teenage Liberation Handbook by Grace Llewellyn, and then later working at her summer camp called Not Back to School Camp, which is still operating. I worked there for over 12 seasons. Um, getting to meet these homeschoolers who take a more self-directed path, and they don't have to be full-on unschoolers. A lot of the kids who I've worked with are more eclectic homeschoolers who do you know, some stuff because their parents want them to, like, yes, mom, I'll do math and study a foreign language because I know it makes you highly anxious if I don't do those things. And then they spend the bulk of their time doing more self-directed learning. And so getting to meet all of them is what changed the tune about homeschooling for me. No, oh, that's great. There's uh, a lot of homeschoolers start switching. Like uh, you and I were talking before about the fact that there's sort of these transitional points in homeschoolers where all of a sudden I don't know if parents feel sort of overwhelmed when they kind of get to these sort of teenage years and then they start to move into it. And there are a, a whole lot of options and alternative education that's available to them now. Like, do you, are you finding that as well? That there's, I don't know if it's a mentorship aspect that parents are looking for. They just, or maybe it's just in the nature. I mean, we'll address that when we talk about chapter four is the sort of this idea that, um, they need somebody other than their parents, but we still want to homeschool. So if you mm. found that as well. Yeah, I think there are these transition moments, like when you would go into middle school or high school traditionally, where parents feel like, well, these are big milestones and these are experiences. These, these are cultural events that my kid should have some exposure to. And so there's that sort of you know, momentum of, of your own history that you can bring into it as a parent. But then there are also, quite real needs that crop up with adolescence. And that is the demographic with whom I've worked the most. And a younger kid is much more parent oriented, happy to absorb knowledge and facts. And when, once you get into adolescence, they become more peer oriented. They wanna learn more socially. And so they do wanna have a more uh, diverse and a larger peer group. So this is a real 
challenge. Uh, I think this is the real socialization challenge and not the one that we hear about where we think they'll never be able to interact with people because that one is largely not true. Yeah. So, yeah. So what do you do if you're, if your kid is a homeschooler and let's say they're turning 12 or 13 and they really want to be around other kids. I mean, this is a tricky moment for a lot of families. You have to go out and find those other kids somehow, whether it's online or offline, you know, ideally it's offline. Uh, you want to find kids that you're, your kids will naturally vibe with, you know, you can't just shove them with other 13 year olds and say, this will automatically work. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of uh, people think will happen if we put kids back in school, just shove them around other kids where, you know, that sh share their age plus or minus one year and naturally great connections are going to happen. We have to be really honest about what the competition is for homeschooling, right? people think just because there's other kids in public school that positive socialization is going to happen. But often a lot of negative socialization happens in school. And that's a lot of my own experience in going to fairly well-funded middle schools and high schools. Yeah. I think that that peer influence is kind of a key aspect, hmm. but that was definitely it's junior high. We call it up here in Canada, but that sort of middle school years is definitely the, the time where I would not want my children in school. Like I, you know, I can understand some of them wanting to transition for high school because that seems like an overwhelming task. But there was, um, I was in, I taught in China for a year and that was the first time I met an unschooler. And uh, mm -hmm. she was really laid back. She was uh, part of the Baha'i faith. She was teaching, you know, English just like I was, but she had this nine-year-old boy with her. Um, she's a single parent and he couldn't read yet. He couldn't write. Um, I don't even think he could tell time on an analog watch. And he was like, just transitioning to 10 and my brain was going, Oh my gosh, you know, like he's not meeting those developmental standards. And, but he was the most amazing kid. He could build anything out of anything like noodles and matchsticks. He built these bridges. He was fantastic to watch. Mm -hmm. And he picked up Chinese that there's dialects. Every single city you go to is a different version of the Chinese and he could pick up the language like crazy. So by the time I was done teaching there for a year, it was like, wow, unschooling. That's like, this is very cool. She called it child-led learning or child-directed learning at the time. I caught up with her when I had my own kids and started unschooling myself. And I said, whatever happened to Matt? And she said, well, in our community, what ends up happening around 12 or 13 is they start looking for structure and they start looking for mentorship and it naturally happens. And there was probably over a hundred people in their unschooled community, again, in California. And so Matt decided you know, he really wanted to take an AutoCAD class. So at, at 13 years old, he's going and taking this sort of continuing ed evening program in AutoCAD. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what started it. And she said he still really wasn't reading fully at that point, which I, you know, I thought, I thought at the time was amazing, even talking to her. I have a late reader in my house as well, like I think 11. And I said, well, where's Matt now? And she said, so you remember the things that this kid could build, right? She said, oh, he has an honors degree in architecture. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Ah, well, <laughs> and, yes. and that's such a common story. It's like kids will learn to do the things that are important to function in adult society when they have a good reason to. I think the most influential person in the world in terms of helping kids read is probably J.K. Rowling. By producing the Harry Potter books, she has inspired more kids and a lot of homeschoolers and unschoolers who I know to, to force themselves to learn how to read very quickly than anyone else in the world. And perhaps, you know, she's done more good than more of the, the reading instructors in the world put together. Yeah, mine was Japanese anime mm -hmm. because he had to read the subtitles and then he could pause the movie, you know, so you could watch it and you get on those sort of hubs of Japanese anime and it's just hours and hours and hours of binge watching subtitled movies and that was it. it took three months and he taught himself his fluency is amazing. He's still not a chapter book reader though, but his reading's amazing, right? So I think- the, the, Go ahead. This leads directly into the question of college, which you mentioned earlier. I was going to go there next. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We're on the same page here. Right on. <laughs> uh, yeah. So many parents say, my kid's 15 and they're still not doing anything that looks like traditional college prep. How will they ever get to college? They compare their 15-year-old to other 15-year-olds in school who are ostensibly making steady progress in a college preparatory curriculum. And it feels like a hopeless, terrifying situation. But in the same way that uh, someone who seems like a non-reader, you know, says, oh, I want to take an AutoCAD class. And then they realize, well, I need to read in order to, to do that. Uh, that is the same process that happens with college. And I've seen this happen over and over again. 
when a young person discovers, okay, something I want to do with my life requires college, or oh, I met this really interesting graduate student who's a, a friend of the family, and wow, that really inspired me to want to get into academics, at least give it a try. Then they will figure out what hoops they need to jump through, they will get the SAT study book, they will fill in the gaps, and you know, if they have developed a, a supportive, loving relationship with their parents and they have other non-parental adults who can support them in their life, then there are not these insurmountable barriers to learning what you have to learn and to jumping through the hoops that you need to jump through in order to get into four-year college. But it's terrifying, again, terrifying to just watch that process, to, to wait for that to happen as an adult, because fundamentally you don't have any guarantees that it is going to happen. Yeah, and we have this milestone of the end of high school and graduation. And when you don't have that rite of passage, when there isn't this milestone, you still stick it on there. You would have graduated this June. So what are you going to do with your life? You know, I, I hear that a lot from a lot of parents that there's this, this imperative all of a sudden for them to figure it all out. They turn 18, you put up your hand, you're an adult now, figure it out. <laughs> you're this something like, you don't have to ask to go to the bathroom anymore. Lucky you. Like, I just, I, I don't understand that transition. And I'm watching a lot of parents go through it now because my oldest is of that age, right? His peer group is, he's only uh, grade 11, but, um, or would be, I guess. My oldest is the one that drank the Kool-Aid and prefers public school. And I think he's revisiting that after the pandemic right now. So we got to well, go that way. I'd like I like the- I want to throw out there, Stacey, in the book, I try to give uh, an equal treatment to all the different options. And I say that even one of the options that might fit your kid for a while is conventional school, whether public or private. And I have known lifelong unschoolers who choose to go back to some part of high school or all of high school because they want to access certain resources or classes, because they do want to have that high school experience with a really big peer group, and they enjoy it. And so I know people who've gone through that story also. I say, whenever you think you found the right educational environment for your kid, add the words for now yeah. at the end, because your kid's going to be a different person year by year in the same way that if you try to predict your own career as an adult for the next 10 years and exactly how you want to work and what your interests are going to be, you will always fail in that regard. Yeah. And I think that what's happening right now is forcing people to take on the hat of for now, right? I mean, it's like whether if you thought it was a linear path, then the world is changing and we need to sort of revisit how we approach this constantly. I'm watching universities making the decision mm. to just stay online for the following year because they won't be able to handle the back and forth and the pulling back or rolling back if they decide to go back to school full time. So I think that's everybody's being forced to deal with that right now. So I, you know, homeschoolers that can be more flexible or, or even parents that have their kids in school right now, that flexibility, I think, will offer a whole world of opportunity to their teens. And you kind of walk through that in the book about, you know, if I, if I don't force them to go through and do this online learning right now or the school right now, and I'm specifically talking about teens, I get this a lot of the, but if I didn't make him do it, he would play video games all day long. And so you talk about the benefits, like kind of go through how you sort of address in the book that that huge fear of, of motivation. I have this lazy teen or this motivational teen. Great question. Well, I think we have to ask what are teens, you know, people of all ages really, but let's say what are teens getting from video games that they so desperately want and need? Let's give video games some, you know, the benefit of the doubt here. And first of all, I'm not talking about games like Candy Crush. I'm talking about the games that, that I like to play growing up and that have only gotten better and more complex and more interesting. And so right. these big multiplayer online games like World of Warcraft or these world building games like The Sims or, My or Minecraft again, uh, or these competitive team games like Fortnite. And these games are places where young people have a sense of control. It's where when they wanna get better at something, they can, a level up as quickly as possible. If they put in the effort, they get the rewards. Uh, I lean on this other book in the chapter about games, uh, which is called Reality is Broken. And in that book, the uh, author who's a game designer says a, a real good game has four elements. There are clear goals. There are clear rules that limit how you can achieve that goal. There is a very effective feedback system that tells you how close you are to achieving the goal. And then finally, any good game is voluntarily chosen. And so she says, you know, imagine golf. 
if you take away any one of those elements, it's no longer a good game. And very quickly, you can take these parameters and say, oh, this is why modern video games and computer games are really engaging because they let a young person um, you know, work towards goals. They have rapid feedback. When you're playing World of Warcraft, you know, the, the reward that you get for beating a quest is not that the game ends. It's that you get to go on another harder quest. And that's a really important thing to notice because what that means is a young person is learning to voluntarily take on challenges and to seek harder and harder things to do. And often they're doing it in a group team environment. Sometimes they're doing it solo, but more often today it's multiplayer. And that is a good habit to develop right there. And so you can look at a kid who seems to be addicted to these games and their whole social life is part of these games. And there's two things to say. First of all, this is only happening for now. They're probably not going to be doing this for five straight years or 10 straight years. But if they're really into it for now, yes, it might be months or a couple years that they stick with this. Uh, and the second thing is, man, they're learning some serious meta learning skills here. They're learning how to stick with something when it's hard, how to work with other people. Uh, you're learning all these higher order thinking skills. I remember being very challenged as a teenager I would come home, finish my homework as quickly as possible, and then go play a complicated role-playing game or a really competitive online first-person shooter game. And, and man, that was, you know, it's, it's hard to know, of course, how much of one's development or learning comes from one source or another. But I felt like I learned a lot from playing complex games, and I think kids today are, are doing the same. Yeah, my husband became a software engineer, I'm sure, because he tried to noodle his way through hacking the VIC-20 so he could play more. I mean, that dates us a little bit. We're a little bit older than you. <laughs> it's like when the computer screen was only this big on the front of it, but it really was, he tried so many other things and then finally came back to, it really was programming that he enjoyed doing. And it was because of computer games that he found mm -hmm. that love. So mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're personally a pretty big advocates about that. So that kind of the idea of questing and adventures sort of leads me to the next question. And uh, one I'm kind of excited and passionate about because I have a personal attachment to it. So um, you have uh, a, a company called Unschool Adventures and my 15 year old is, uh, is signed up for that, uh, which I'm- Ooh, He's super he has, excited he has, about it, if it happens. <laughs> he has applied. He has not signed up, Stacey. Right, I've never, you're right. I've he never let anyone <laughs> sign up. They have to interview and show that they are personally really interested in going on, on a trip. Because That's right. Because it wouldn't just take someone accepted. who gets signed up. <laughs> <laughs> he has to be accepted. So right. he, has, he has requested to be interviewed to be part of this, <laughs> and, which is clear. Um, and I, I think back, I think that the reason why it's definitely part of your book where we talk about adventures and meaningful work. Um, my middle one went on a, a sailing trip last year and it's a, a tall ship. Um, and it's 30 to 33 kids with a crew of like eight or 10, those massive three mast ships, right? Like they were really, really big. Mm -hmm. And you, you pay to be on the ship like a summer camp, but you are, you are crew. Like you are from the moment you open your eyes until you go to bed. And sometimes in the middle of the night, if you have to do night watch, you clean the head, you have to help cook, you're polishing the brass. I mean, everybody has a role. And even the social aspect on the boat, because you're all crammed together, sleeping in these sort of tiered berths that are in the, in the hull of the ship, you're in close quarters and you know nobody. Very few people go on these trips that know any other of the teens and they're 13 all the way up to 19. So a huge broad range. And you have to, at the end of the day, um, they say grace. I think they're a non-denominational Christian organization, like pretty loosey-goosey, but they require that you sing, that you share embarrassing moments about yourself, that you stand up and make a speech, and they do offshore stuff. But it, he came off and he said, I can't believe that's over. I don't want it to end. And I said, did you have fun? No, it's not fun. <laughs> it was sort of this balance this juxtaposition between yeah. no actually that was really hard work and nothing on there was comfortable not the way that you yeah. slept not the way that you interact and yet that was probably the best time of my life he said yeah. and the reason why he has applied to be part of your program and so in your book you, you kind of dedicate a whole chapter towards this idea of questing and adventures independent travel if anything else as well as finding meaningful work, 
because kids don't necessarily have a purpose in society and in our economy mm -hmm. right now. So um, walk me walk me through that chapter and why this is so important for teens, especially. Your son's experience is really illustrative. And uh, yeah, let's start with, with meaningful work. So you asked, was that fun? He said, no, but it was wonderful. And it was one of the best experiences of my young life. And I think that's because it gave him meaning. It gave him a sense of purpose. And adolescents throughout history have had meaningful work to do. They've had ways to contribute to home economies, to other people's businesses. Sometimes they were starting their own families, you know, before they were, you know, turning 20. And there's a lot of aspects of that, especially child labor aspects, which, you know, it's a good thing that that's not the default scenario for most kids today. But there's still this, I think, historical, perhaps even evolutionary drive for an adolescent to feel useful to someone somehow. And today, the default option given to most kids is to uh, prove that you're useful by performing well in school. Or it could be performing well in a conventional homeschool. You know, if your homeschooling is tracking the, the local school's curricula, then it might be the exact same situation with a slightly better social environment. And the thing is, some kids will feel like they are doing something meaningful with their lives by doing a traditional academic curriculum. Most kids will not. It will feel irrelevant. It will feel disconnected. They will feel alienated. And if, especially if they're just not able to perform very well and most of the feedback that they're getting is negative, critical feedback, just imagine being a young person who doesn't naturally excel in academics, being told for 12 straight years that you are essentially not any good at what you're supposed to be doing and there's no you know it's monopolizing all of your time you are not allowed to contribute to any sort of world in any meaningful way that's why kids go on to video games and they go on to these you know weird online communities because at least there they can feel like they are a member of a community where they are valued and respected and where they can contribute somehow and so i think Going back to the video game thing, it's not about video games or computer games per se. It's about those principles of gaming and what, and what makes something highly engaging. And so your son discovered that working on this tall ship where there are clear expectations or goals for him, there's clear rules about how you can do that. Uh, there's clear feedback, like if you don't clean the toilet well, you're going to hear about it. And then, but fundamentally, he wasn't cons uh, conscripted. It was a voluntary choice. So yeah. that tall ship experience was a game-like experience and that is why so many kids love i mean the part of school that they that do love is band or drama or mock trial or robotics club or journalism that's the kind of stuff where they can opt in and they have clear goals and then they excel and they love it but so much of the other stuff the traditional curriculum is just not the same and way. It doesn't give you the same effects. It doesn't engage students. It mostly bores them. And if your kid is one of those kids, then I think we need to flip the equation. And instead of saying we need to do mostly traditional schoolwork and then a little bit of self-directed learning after that, it needs to be mostly self-directed learning and then a little bit of schoolwork or hoop jumping, uh, if, if even that. Yeah, I heard Seth Godin once do a speech saying that school needs to change so fundamentally away from somebody lecturing at the front of the room to you go off and learn what you need to. And then we come together to do robotics and group and collaborative work and ask questions. The teacher moves into mentor co coach role, not in this sort of stand at the front of the room. And I'm not actually going to give you a grade for this. He thinks yeah. that I want to throw something at you and say, build something interesting. He said, and most kids today that he said, actually most team members today in business freak out at that because there's no gold star or guidelines or any kind of direction. And that scares the heck out of people. So you almost wonder if whether or not the dogma of, you know, learn this in a specific way under the structure and change classroom times at the chime of a bell. I mean, we, all of us that are a part of homeschooling understand the whole factory worker construct that schooling really was based on but you know my my older one that you said there's different ways of doing homeschool or doing schooling and he chooses to be there because there's a really unique program of choice at that school and i have to say if that wasn't in existence he probably wouldn't be super keen to mm -hmm. sort of go there but when i you know we 
we think about parenting and the choices that we make and why we ask our kids to do what we do and having the age of children that I have right now, um, what I think people need to understand and what I, where I think your book is really helpful. I have read this chapter to four people <laughs> because your <laughs> book wasn't out yet. Oh, you had to listen to this. So in chapter four, we talk about, you kind of dive into that sort of intensive parenting and you quote Judith Rich Harris, which I've never read the nurture assumption. And that now I want to go out and buy it because it's amazing. But a lot of my friends who are homeschooling or now they've actually switched from homeschooling to let, you know, saying their kids have to go to high school when it counts. Oh, you have to go now because it counts. And they are interestingly psychologists and school counselors or school teachers themselves. And they're struggling with this idea of you don't have as, you're not, you don't have any control. It becomes very apparent when you're the parent of a teen. And we, we seem to be butting up against this idea that, you know, this was like we had the best relationship till they were 14 or 15 years old. And that relationship is falling apart. And I think it has a lot to do with what you address in this chapter about, about this inter intensive parenting style and the idea that you can actually control this outcome. So kind of um, walk me through why you chose to include this chapter, first of all, in the book, because I think it's really important. It's almost one of the most significant parts, even though it has nothing to do with schooling. So mm. let's kind of break that down. Yeah, it's definitely destined to be the least popular chapter of the book <laughs> in terms I of- I liked it. <laughs> well, I liked it too, but it's not a message many people want to hear. And right. first of all, to be clear, I'm not a parent, so I lack a certain foundational experience there, but I have played the role of crazy uncle slash adventure <laughs> travel leader to a thousand, not thousands, hundreds of teens at this point over the course of 15 years. And so I think that counts for something. Um, yeah, I uh, stumbled into this book, The Nurture Assumption by Judith Rich Harris, um, thanks to a podcast that I listened to that, that said, well, you know, it's pretty, the research is pretty clear. Uh, parenting does not make nearly the impact that we imagine it does. And I thought that was a fascinating idea right there. And after reading her book, I thought, oh my gosh, this totally connects to the world of alternative education and especially for adolescents. So I ended up doing a lot more research into the parenting literature and the history of parenting and how it's changed over the past hundred years. And uh, I mean, we could talk for a whole hour just about that, Stacy. The punchline here is the situation that we have today is that there is a, an accepted dogma that was once just something that upper middle class parents uh, really practiced, and now it's practiced by essentially all of society in, in North America and many other developed uh, Western countries, and that is intensive parenting. And intensive parenting, it's kind of a tricky thing to pin down, but it's this uh, philosophy that says, I can really control the outcomes of my kid's life. If I just work hard enough, if I micromanage well enough, um, I think the best example of this philosophy in practice is the tiger mom philosophy of, of really, you know, t tightly controlling your kid's life and making sure that they can achieve these high benchmarks, like getting into an Ivy league college. And most people don't practice something as extreme as that, but the normal version right now is extreme by the, the, you know, historical standards. And so uh, there's many reasons that intensive parenting has come to become the norm over just the past few decades, but uh, it doesn't matter that, you know, how it came to be here. What matters is that we all share as parents this belief that we can really control the outcomes of our kids' lives. And what Judith Rich Harris said in the Nurture Assumption, using a lot of arguments from the nature-nurture debate, the you know, ge uh, genetics versus environment debate, she said, listen, there's two things going on when you're parenting and when you think that you are you know, affecting the trajectory of your kid's life. There are uh, genes, there is the biological data that you have passed down to your kid and the scientific community essentially agrees that that is responsible for 50% of the variability of, for example, measured personality traits or other things that you can measure like uh, long, you know, divorce rates, uh, you know, income, these the sort of long-term big indicators that uh, people are generally concerned about for their kids. So half of it is, you know, did you pass down your, your genes to your kid? The answer is yes. And the other half is, well, nurture. And as the title of her book suggests, we assume that the nurture comes from parents. 
But really, she makes the argument that the nurture is mostly coming from peers. And so uh, for many reasons, kids, especially adolescents, will orient much more towards their peers and they will take cues from their, their cohort. And to a small extent, you can affect that as a parent by controlling which peers your kid hangs out with. But that becomes much more difficult as your kid grows up. And eventually, of course, they're going to move out at some point and you will have zero control whatsoever about who they hang out with. And so the best thing you can do, Judith Rich Harris says, is you can just have a great one-on-one -on -one loving relationship with your kid in the same way that you do with a spouse, uh, with a spouse or with a sibling or with a friend. And she says, the way that you treat your spouse matters uh, in the sense that your spouse will either want to continue spending time with you and be friends with you or not. Same thing with friends, siblings. And that's the same with your kids too. If you want to have a great long-term relationship with them where you want to spend time with each other, then you need to treat them in a loving and respectful way. And I think that a lot of uh, the modern system of education gets in the way of having a, a straightforward, loving and respectful relationship with your kid. Yeah, I think that it's that need to compare and the system sets it up to ask for that. So we, it's ever, everything from developmental milestones to academic success even competition in sports. I mean, some of the best parts about being in school uh, is the sports and the clubs, and they, they even create a scenario of haves and have nots in that situation. So, and the kids thrive and, and gravitate towards that, you know, because they are optional, which I think is great, but that we've always, I mean, in, in, my, in our household, we, uh, we've read John Kabat-Zinn's Everyday Blessings, which is a parenting book. I, I mean, it's, he's a big meditation guy, but he has this book that's for parents, and he has this whole chapter about sovereignty how you have to allow your child sovereignty and the best advice he had was treat the children treat your children like they're a guest in your house and if I you treat that. them that way always then you know they'll want to they'll want to hang around because you're treating them with a kindness i don't mean you know serving them at their beck and call that's something entirely different other than you know i i i I was raised where I walked into the room and I was immediately corrected, right? Have you done this? Uh, where is that? Can mm -hmm. you bring your stuff? Why haven't you not? You know, it was rare that I got, good morning, how are you today? <laughs> you know, that sort of starting that sort of conversation that way. So I, I loved the chapter because it sort of brings to light the idea, especially that part, that one quote where you said they are with you 18 short years. That, that's all you've got. And in the ma in a mass span of that person's life, you are a drop, a very small drop into that. And why can't that be enjoyable? Why does it have to be a struggle? And I think it's that crippling fear. I mean, I think I wrote in the email to you that we joke all the time when we decided to homeschool that, yeah, they could end up 40 with a neck beard and a graphic tee in our basement playing video games. <laughs> We're not sort of forcing them to go. Are we wrecking our kids? And so I think that, um, I want to talk about, you, you talked about overcoming that boss level challenge, that Herculean concept of your uncredentialed 18 year old, and how do you support them to, what was it, launch? You know, that sort of the failure to launch idea. Mm -hmm. What do we do as parents? How do you address it in the book, especially about this, this, huge, this huge challenge? Because it is a bit of a crippling fear that Although my husband, I think, is the 40-something-year-old guy with the neck beard and the, and the graphic <laughs> yeah. team playing video games That's in right. my basement, so, so Some Apple people like that are, are highly successful. Let's, let's exactly. acknowledge that first. Maybe it's a bad, a bad comparison or yeah. a, bad, a bad, you know, look. But, well, uh, yeah, well, how what do I we like do to it? joke about is, you know, is my kid going to wind up living in my basement at age 27, wiping flaming hot Cheeto dust off his his shirt, as he says, like, mom, get me another Mountain Dew. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that, do that that's now. the failure. <laughs> yeah, you're right. that's the failure to launch worry. And True. there's a few uh, kind of disclaimers I want to put out there. First of all, if you live uh, in a house where there really isn't room for your kid to keep hanging around, like you live in a very small apartment, and you're, and you're like, when you turn 18, you actually need to go out so we have space to like take care of grandma or something like that. Then that's one situation. But a lot of the families I know who are choosing the homeschooling or unschooling path are, are not in that situation. And they really could let their kid continue to live at home for a bit longer. And you know the, the cost, the marginal cost of feeding one more person in the household is not that high. And so there's not an actual crisis 
of like, you have to move out now. It's eight, you've turned 18. You have to get your life together immediately and move out. There's no actual crisis. It's, as you said, it's this milestone. It's this uh, coming of age type thing that we think is very important. And it's, it's a cultural belief. And so one way to approach this is to try to discard the cultural belief. And some people have a better, uh, success, more success with doing that than others. I know some families that say, yeah, I just let my kid you know, live at home until 22. And then they decided, okay, now it's time for me to go be you know, in a, an adult, so to speak. Um, and I know other families that said, no, we, we said when, once you turn 18, you're out of here. And so I've seen success in both of those cases. Another important disclaimer is when we think of an 18 year old who has failed to launch, and by that we probably mean has not gone into, you know, jumped through the hoops to get into a good college or gotten a decent job, then what standard are we comparing this person to? Because if we're comparing um, this, a homeschooler or unschooler, an alternatively schooled kid to this mythical standard of like a superstar 18 year old who we assume that they really should have become since we put in so much love and, and energy into this, this nurturing educational environment for them, then we might be holding them up to too high of a standard, to be honest, because there are a lot of kids who go through the regular conventional school system. And at age 18, they have graduated with an accredited high school diploma. And do they have any idea what they want to do next? Do they have any way to support themselves? Uh, are they, you know, really likely to live at home and sort of wonder, what am I going to do next? Yes. And actually, in North America, those kids, the ones who have gone through the conventional school system and who have been told by everyone else, you did it right. You have passed through the, the, the milestones. Now it's time for your next milestone, which is college. Those are the kids who are at the most risk of going into a higher education system and taking on debt to you know, jump through the next hoop and then realizing that they're not able to handle college. They're emotionally not ready for it. They're mentally or academically not ready for it. And then you have an actually bad situation on your hands, which is a kid who does a few years of college, takes on debt, drops out of college because they weren't ready for it. They didn't know why they were going there in the first place. And then you have a 19 or 20 year old with a you know, few tens of thousands of dollars in debt on their hands. Now that is a hard situation. That is what you don't want to put your kid into. And so when you're thinking, geez, they're 18 and they haven't shown natural inclination for going to college yet, th consider that a blessing, okay? Because you can let your kid hang out and get their act together and figure out what they want to work on and do little experiments for a few more years. And then they can make an informed choice about going to college or about not going to college. And that is much better no matter which direction they go. If it's an informed choice, they know why they're making that choice and they're intrinsically motivated to follow through on it, then that is the path to success. Yeah. And those ones that go and do that have meltdowns in like year three or the beginning of year four. And guess where they move? Back home. <laughs> so you think that they're going to go away, but they actually come back and they need to, right? I mean, they're really at the end of yeah, their road. That's right. And then you have that expectation that they finish now, you know, I, even if, um, if we've had the ability to put away for our kids university or college, or we put them in a, a structure where it doesn't actually matter what they want to do with it. So if they say, I'd like to do a pilot's license, or I want to travel the world for a year, that money goes to whatever their vision or goal is. Uh, but I think that some parents say, well, just, you know, go and try it and I'll pay for it. But the second there's a dollar value attached to it, there's this expectation of completion. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I think that that is also causing a lot of stress and anxiety with sort of college-aged kids. So I've been on a few panels talking about how do we keep them motivated to finish without losing their mind and they're getting sick and they're overwhelmed. I mean, that's not everybody. I get that. And I loved it. I couldn't wait to go to university. But I mean, I changed and, my major eight times too. <laughs> so and, was... and I loved my university experience also, but also it's, it's documented that there is a mental health crisis among college yeah. aged young adults taking place right now. And this yeah. is something that has changed just over the past decade in a really significant way. Yeah. That's an amazing book. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for sharing it with us. I'm so glad that you wrote that book. There you go. Now you know. That was like, I called it your magnum opus, right? <laughs> because it was sort of this culmination of all this information was directed at 
those of us who really need to hear that a change uh, needs to occur and that there's alternative choices that exist. And so I really appreciate you spending time with us, Blake, and thanks so much. My pleasure, Stacey.